also called the world. Horace Bruce Rowling was born on December 5, 1947. He was educated at St. George's College, Jamaica College, and um, we have a private book that he also came to own uh, <laughs> at the University of West Indies. Sorry, at the University of West Indies, where he majored in economics and public administration. He was first elected to Parliament in 1972 at the age of 24, where he served in both houses of Parliament for a com combination of 36 years. During his long period of public service, Bruce Rowling has held various positions at the national level, including Member of the Electoral Advisory Committee, now the Electoral Commission of Jamaica, Minister of Construction, Opposition Spokesman and Finance, Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, Leader of the Opposition, and Prime Minister of Jamaica. At the regional and international level, he has served as Chairman of the United Nations Commission on Human Settlement, Chairman of Car CARICOM, and CARICOM Head with Special Responsibility for External Trade Negotiations. He was a member of the international team of experts deployed in South Africa to assist in preparing that country for its first post apartheid election in 1994. Mr. Golding currently serves as an honorary distinguished fellow at the University of West Indies and is undertaking the developmental research in public policy as well as private, private public partnerships. Mr. Golding has been married for 42 years and his wife, Lorna, he and his wife, Lorna Golding, has one, one son, two daughters, and four grandchildren. Now, on a private note, um, Mr. Golding, I was just had a conversation with Mr. Golding a while ago. And I, I, I was trying to remind him that he's actually my neighbor um, from Barton, St. Catherine. Um, Mr. Golding is speaking on a topic that I don't know if he, if he actually knows, but in 1991, um, when I was at the first community college doing A level politics, and I was, um, I, I was actually a part of a team of students who went to Parliament to hear Mr. Golding speak on the very same topic. So it's very fortuitous and, and, and quite coincidental that I'm here now again um, at this point here actually introducing Mr. Golding to speak on the very same topic that he had spoken on while he was at Parliament. And, 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 and this is more than um, a story for me, Mr. Golding, you know, an inspiration for me. And I'm number 30, so I, I, I have to admit. Um, but your cultural skills are excellent and very entertaining and, 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 honor, and I'm glad to be here today to present. I told Professor Meek that in, in your absence, if you didn't come today, I would have spoken on your behalf. But <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately, I, know I couldn't do you justice. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Bruce Golding. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. And of course, I feel obliged to especially acknowledge the presence of the Prime Minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, who has rescheduled his departure flight. He told me a while ago to see for himself whether my level of wisdom has been expanded and enhanced by time and age. But thank you, Ralph. Thank you for being here. I think it's fair to assume that Brian and Kate, in putting the agenda together, wanted to have a range of different views. And I think it's fair to assume as well that by having Ralph and Peter and me on the program, that it was expected that that would have exemplified the range of views that they wanted. But you know, as I listened to Peter yesterday morning and well, in the afternoon, it seems to me that that range is in danger of constriction. <laughs> and you know, given, given our different political antecedents, it's a moot question as to who has traveled a further distance along that linear spectrum. But it reminds me of something we used to discuss when I was on campus, and that was the de-radicalization of radicals. And I believe that that is what Hamid yesterday was attributing to Eric Williams. It is something that Ralph is fighting desperately not to have history say of him. But I remember yesterday as well, Peter, when he was speaking, made a point 
that if the Westminster system is to work effectively, it has to find a way to engender consensus. And convergence is in fact a precursor of consensus. Now there has been much discussion, including at this conference, and a great deal of scholarly work that has been done about the choice of the Westminster system by Jamaica and other Caribbean countries as we transition from colonization to independence. Now, Trevor Monroe, in his book, I think the title of it was The Politics of Constitutional Decolonization in Jamaica. It was written a long time ago, um, in fact, in 1972, more than 40 years ago. But in that book, he documents the scant consideration that was given in the framing of our constitution to any major deviation from the Westminster prototype into which we have been initiated. Not just since, but especially since, even the from before, but especially since the First Order in Council in 1944. And many people have chided the framers of our constitution for undue orthodoxy and conservatism. I think it is arguable whether we really had a choice. Some British colonies in Africa, in the Caribbean, in Asia, and Peter Philip made the point yesterday, they had indigenous forms of organization and administration which were able to survive the period of colonization, and therefore they had something, a reference, that could have influenced, even if it could not define completely the form of government that they would choose. Norman Manley made the point during the debate on the Constitution Bill in 1962, and I want to quote him. Let us not make the mistake of describing as colonial institutions which are part and parcel of the heritage of this country. End of quote. And Lloyd Barnett, in a book written many years later, uh, made very much the same point, that this was something that we had practiced and had at least some familiarity with. Let us remember as well that at the time when the Constitution was, was put together, such advocacy as there was for any radical change was driven more by anti-colonial passion and a feeling that we, need, we needed to bake to make a, a, a break, even if it is only symbolic, with the colonial past. There was no coherent articulation of any alternative form. Now we know it is a fact that in putting the Constitution together, the whole thing was put on fast rapid. The Constitution, from beginning to end, was put together in three months, and there was hardly much effort made for any serious public consultation. But even if that were not so, it is doubtful that the outcome would have been much different given the apathy that prevailed among the general population about political matters and constitutional matters, which is something that Trevor Monroe observed in his book as well. So that in the end, in the absence of a clear alternative, and given the anxieties that existed about change and uncertainty, the inclination to stick with what we know and the felt need for as seamless a transition as possible easily triumphed. The debate continues and will continue for a long time as to whether the Westminster system has been good for us or whether it has failed us. It is a debate that is not likely to lead to any conclusion because the term Westminster is often used to mean different but not unconnected things. In one instance, it may simply be a constitutional arrangement, the outcomes of which are determined by the functionaries that are created by the Constitution. In another, it may refer to a far more complex scheme that predetermines and institutionalizes economic relations, social relations, and outcomes. And I believe that this is the view that Horace Matthews had when I was following his line of questioning yesterday. In the latter case, it is often nailed as the principal cause of all the things that 
that afflict us. Poverty, crime, corruption, the alienation of the people, etc. I think we need to approach, approach such a conclusion with a great deal of caution, and I'm going to come back to that in a short while. Discussions about the West Indian model face another dilemma. And that is that there is no fixed model or template that defines Westminster. Many versions exist within and outside of the Commonwealth. There are some basic elements that must be present. Suffrage, guaranteed periodic elections, a largely non-executive head of state, a directly elected chamber of representatives with a prime minister and cabinet chosen primarily, if not entirely, from among those representatives and who are accountable to the representatives themselves and a separately constituted judiciary. But beyond those basics, Westminster takes off in all sorts of directions and many variations are to be found from New Zealand to Jamaica, from Singapore to Israel. They may be monarchical, they may be republican. They may be first past the post or proportionally representative or a hybrid of the two, as I think Ralph was suggesting in his constitutional reform effort. They may be unicameral or bicameral. They may be unitary or federal. They may be constitution sovereign or parliament sovereign. The real measure of governance in any Westminster-based country, therefore, is not just the existence of these basic elements, but how they relate to each other in both structure and practice. This lack of rigidity, which I think is perhaps the most significant feature of the Westminster model, can easily be understood from the fact, and the point is, was stated yesterday is well known, that the, Westminster, the British Constitution is, is unwritten. It derives from a whole body of customs and traditions and conventions and statutes and judicial decisions and treaties that have been accumulated over, over centuries. Such a constitutional arrangement might well have unraveled or be easily manipulated were it not supported by a culture that has withstood the passage of time and is intrinsic to the workings of vintage Westminster. It is this culture that neutralizes to some extent the inherent hazard of the pure Westminster model, which is the intense de facto concentration of power in the hands of the prime minister that makes it in practice, if not in appearance, a constitutional dictatorship. Separation of powers between the executive and the legislature is an illusion. The ability of parliament to hold the executive accountable is more imaginary than real. In our case, no such reliance on culture was even contemplated. Our arrangements had to be put in black and white, and in that black and white, some not insignificant deviations from the Westminster prototype were introduced as safeguards against its inherent concentration of power. Indeed, and I found this quite significant, in reading a paper that was written by the late Professor A. Ralph Carnegie. He insisted that the notion that is so often expressed, that all Commonwealth Caribbean states, with the exception of Ghana, were Westminster models, he said that that notion was a myth, that we had moved significantly away from the classic Westminster prototype. It has been argued that what emerged reflected in part Britain's determination to ensure that we adhere to the principles of Westminster. Had to be put in black and white because you guys are not going to show the culture that supports these traditions. Therefore, let's put it down in black and white. But you know, this does not sync with the report of the late Theodore Steele, who covered the Lancaster House deliberations and who said that the British officials thought that we sought, and I want to quote from his report, the British officials thought that we sought, quote unquote, to provide for too many eventualities, and that the final draft constitution was, quote again, too static in its reliance on the past, too timid in its caution for the future. Now, that's what the British is saying about what we were insisting should be our constitutional arrangement. It has also been argued that these safeguards 
reflected the mistrust that existed between the key players, the PMP and the JLP, Bustamante and Manly, and the unwillingness of each to leave too much to chance when the other side holds the reins of power. But in response to that, I suggest that mistrust is not an unusual feature, but one could argue is an important component of constitution making. Some 20 years ago, after I had served in both government and opposition for the previous 20 years, I came to the view that the Westminster system was not appropriate for Jamaica. I held the view that its winner-take-all character had cemented a level of political stability that was not only destructive in and of itself, but made it impossible for us as a people, let alone politicians on opposing sides, to find common cause in tackling problems that transcended political division. The people's representatives, elected in good faith, either had pawned their mandate to an all-powerful executive in the case of the members on the government side, or in the case of those on the opposition side, they had been placed where they belonged, outside the arena of authority. I came to the view then that effective separation of powers with a directly elected president and a separately elected parliament, each with clearly defined but intersecting powers, would provide a better framework for governance. And I campaigned vigorously in the 90s for such a change. I subsequently resigned from that position. Separation of powers can either involve constructive, deliberative engagement between the executive and the legislature, or it can lead to a debilitating standoff. And as I argued with people, disgusted with persons who supported my view as well as persons who were, were fiercely opposed, it became increasingly apparent to me that if we lacked the culture to make Westminster work, we were not likely to have the culture to make the presidential system work either. What we are witnessing now in Washington, regarded as a mature democracy, between the Obama administration and the Congress where the Republicans control one house, not two, as was the case, for example, with Bill Clinton. But what we are seeing there illustrates the hazards with which our not so mature democracy would have had the content. The United States has multiple layers of institutions that keep it going, even where political dysfunctionality exists. You know, a major U.S. Invest investor was quoted as saying that if you are to hear breaking news that the president has been assassinated, he would be deeply disturbed. If, on the other hand, he were to hear that the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board has been assassinated, he would be frightened. We in Jamaica just don't have that level of sophistication to be able to mitigate against the kind of, of, of gridlock that we are now seeing in Washington. But the change in my position did not remove my discomfort with the Westminster system as we have practiced it. It simply meant finding other ways to fix it. And in seeking to do that, I came to the view that it is better to insert the critical safeguards against excessive executive power in the Constitution rather than hope that those safeguards will flow naturally from the separation of power. This is especially so if both sets of power come from either Oathope Road or Belmont Road, as is not just possible but very likely given the voting pattern that we have seen in Jamaica over the years. And in such a situation, those safeguards and that separation would be more imaginary than real. It must be acknowledged that some efforts were made by the framework of our Constitution to mitigate the concentration of power by inserting provisions that did not exist in the classic Westminster model. Indeed, some of them can be said to be innovative because they did not appear in the constitution of any other commonwealth country. Jamaica's constitution, for example, was the first one to 
specifically recognize the position of leader of the opposition and to vest certain functions in that position. Those efforts were not without flaws. For example, the Bill of Rights was placed on tenuous footing since any government could, by simple, a simple act of parliament, make those provisions redundant if it was considered by the government, not by any other authority, by the government, to be in the interest of public safety, defense, public order, public morality, public health, the sort of narrative in the Constitution of the Caribbean Commonwealth countries. And yet the inclusion of a Bill of Rights any at all was a major triumph over a strongly argued view that it would, quote unquote, derogate from the sovereignty of Parliament. Australia, for example, has fiercely resisted putting a Bill of Rights in its own constitution. Some have argued, especially in the ideolo ideologically charged period of the 60s and 70s, that these safeguards were too restrictive and fettered governments from pursuing bold, progressive, transformative programs that could have changed the course of our history. Others may well argue, thank God for those setters. Otherwise, the course of our history would indeed have changed. There can be no question that the checks and balances against executive power were structured around having a government on one side and an opposition on the other side. What Trevor in his book described as institutionalized dissent, which is a core principle of the Westminster system. What this did do is not so much to entrench the two-party system, which is what many people claim that it did. Uh, because if you look at Section 80 of the Constitution, which makes provision for the appointment of the leader of the opposition, it goes on to say that the leader of the opposition shall be the person who, in the opinion of the Governor General, commands the support of the greater, the largest number of persons. But it, in fact, goes on to say that if there is no such person, then the person to be appointed would be the member who commands the support of the largest single group of such members who are prepared to support one leader. So that the Constitution envisaged a possibility of multi-parties in Parliament. But what it wanted was to ensure that you have a government in office and a government in waiting. The Westminster system is essentially built around the concept of the rotation of power, not the sharing of power. So you, hence a government in office and a government in waiting. Um, now, I was involved in a third party attempt in Jamaica. All of them have failed since 1944. But I think the reasons for their failure have to be found elsewhere. Did we make a mistake when we didn't get rid of Westminster at the start of independence? Is Westminster to be blamed for our lack of progress, for the persistent crises that have engulfed us? Empirical evidence does not validate such a correlation. Of the two dozen former British colonies in Africa and the Caribbean that gained independence in the second half of the last century, beginning with Ghana in 1957, and the last one being and kids in 1983, a half of those countries switched soon afterwards from the Westminster system to the presidential model. Of the other half that retained the Westminster model, 11 are from the Caribbean. The only one that is not from the Caribbean, I believe, is Swaziland. On a range of objective criteria, the conclusion cannot be drawn that the Westminster system has been a hindrance to those countries that have retained it. Indeed, the contrary could and has often been argued. The average annual rate of growth in the Westminster countries has been 2.6%, compared to less than 0.5% in the others. On the human rights, on the UN Human Development Index, all but one of the Westminster countries outrank those with other forms of government with an average index of 0.723 compared to 0.521. On the issue of crime and corruption, the former colonies are scattered across the indices with no discernible correlation with their particular form of government. We heard Ralph speak yesterday, for example, about St. Vincent's position in terms of her freedom. 
freedom of the press, ranking above Canada and the U.S. and, and so on. I make this point not so much to argue the merits of the Westminster system, but simply to suggest that the failings associated with it may be founded on shaky ground. The fact is that there is a wide range of factors, some of them peculiar to particular countries, which determine performance outcomes and impact different forms of government in both similar and different ways, a point that Trevor made yesterday. We have the benefit of hindsight which our founding fathers did not have. We have had 52 years of hands-on, real-time experience working with this constitution. If it has failed us, the blame must be placed at our feet, not at the feet of those who devised it. Has it failed? The Westminster system has been credited, as Peter Phillips said yesterday, for providing stability to our democratic process, for facilitating orderly transition of power even when our politics was at its most polarized and the fabric of our democracy was most severely tested. But it has failed in some important respects. It has failed in securing basic human rights for the ordinary citizen, in making government truly representative, in holding accountable those in whom power is vested, in preventing ruinous executive action that has blighted the hopes and potential of generations of Jamaicans. In contrast to those who have, would have preferred the 1962 Constitution to be less restrictive, to better facilitate strong governments, and to enable them to be bold and transformational, I have felt that the strictures imposed were necessary, but not sufficient. They were not sufficient to prevent the persecution of Rastafarians the almost daily detention without charge of ordinary citizens, the abuse of emergency powers, the restrictions that have been imposed in the past on freedom of expression, taxation without the approval of the people's representatives, the accumulation of debt that now leaves us with less than 50 cents in the dollar to address the myriad of needs that the country faces. I think it's important for us to appreciate that a constitution is not a firewall. It does not absolutely prevent these things any more than the constitutional right to life can prevent murders from being committed. What it can do is to fix boundaries, to enable violators to be held accountable and appropriate sanctions to be applied. That is the deterrent and regressive force that it must have. Most of the former British colonies in Africa, the Asia and the Pacific, have rewritten their constitutions at least once, some of them two or three times. In the Caribbean, Ghana is the only one to have done so, although Trinidad, Trinidad did convert to a republic in 1976. The need for review of our constitution was long recognized from the 1970s. The political turbulence of that period did not provide an atmosphere in which it could be pursued. Given the collaborative approach that the security systems embedded in the Constitution require. But that review process enjoyed much greater traction in the 1990s with the establishment of the Constitutional Reform Commission. And as we heard yesterday, its recommendations went before a joint select committee in 1994 and were in large measure adopted in 1995. To the surprise of many, and I'm saying this particularly after hearing Ralph yesterday talk about his own experiences in Parliament with, with constitutional reform. To the surprise of many, there was substantial consensus between the government and opposition, including on issues that require a two-third majority, issues that could not proceed unless there was agreement between the government and opposition, indeed, on issues that require, in addition to the two-thirds majority, the matter being put before the people by way of a referendum. But while they are to be commended for this constructive approach, politicians past and present, and I include myself in that, must take responsibility 
but the inertia that has caused the process of enactment in large measure to languish for 20 years. We did manage in 2011 to put into effect one important part of the agreed recommendation, the replacement of the Bill of Rights, with a much strengthened charter of fundamental rights that are now made justiciable. What are these elements of constitutional reform that have been languishing for so long? I think it's important to mention them quickly. One, we have agreed that Jamaica should advance from a monarchy where, the Queen, where Queen, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth is the Queen of Jamaica to a republic with our own president as head of state. This is more than mere formality. I want to stress this. And it is more than simply repatriating our sovereignty. For the president in our situation is to be more than just a ceremonial figurehead. He or she is to constitute a major restraint on executive power. We came to this approach in 1979 when we sought to fix the electoral system that had been abused and man manipulated by successive governments to the point where it had become a national crisis. The Governor General now selects the largest block of members of the Electoral Commission, a format that has led to a restoration of confidence in the conduct of elections. This same approach has been used since then in making appointments to a number of other critical positions, the Contractor General, the Broadcasting Commission, the Public Broadcasting Corporation, the Public Defender, the Children's Advocate, the Political Ombudsman, and the Independent Commission of Investigation. This is a major deviation from classic Westminster. It is almost unthinkable to see the Queen in England performing any of these functions. Secondly, it has been agreed that this power of the President to make appointments would be extended to include the Chief Justice, the President of the Court of Appeal, and members of the Judicial, Police, and Public Service Commission. Thirdly, provision would be made in the Constitution for impeachment of a wide range of public officials, elected and non-elected, and there, is a, and there would be a requirement that immediately after every election, a five-member impeachment tribunal must be constituted that would oversee the impeachment process. And the requirement, the agreement, Peter, as I recall, was that this tribunal must be set up within 35 days after an election. Critical bodies such as the Electoral Commission, Contractor General, and the Public Defender now established merely by ordinary statute and therefore repealable by ordinary statute, would be enshrined in the Constitution. The Senate was to be expanded to 36 members, with the government appointing 20, opposition 14, and two to be appointed by the President representing other interests. Provision would be made to widen the local standard for class actions, as well as to enable any citizen acting in the public interest and without having to obtain the prior consent of the Attorney General to be able to challenge in the court any action of government. So he does not to indicate, does not to show how he's, this thing affects him personally. He can do it in the public interest. And then <laughs> the other thing which I had mentioned in the discussions yesterday is that the decisions of the DPP are now to be made subject to judicial, judicial review. What is preventing us from moving forward on these matters? There are some technical issues that need to be resolved. I mentioned them as briefly as I can. One. In this new framework, the President becomes far more functional and pivotal than the Governor General in our present dispensation. It is a feature that is not found in any other Westminster-based constitution where the functions of the Governor General or President are merely formality. But it has worked for us. The way in which the President is chosen, therefore, becomes critical. A President, the Governor General, is chosen by the Prime Minister. And we are fortunate to have had a succession of governors general who have exercised their judgment in a creditable manner. But that's not sufficient to rely on going forward, especially when we are expanding that role and moving the governor general's authority or the president's authority in such critical areas. It is no mean achievement. No mean achievement. Again, looking at the St. Vincent experience, it is no mean achievement that the government and opposition agreed that the president would be nominated by the prime minister 
after consulting with the leader of the opposition, and that that nomination would require a two-thirds majority in both houses of parliament. In Trinidad and Tobago, for example, the president is chosen by a simple majority of both houses sitting jointly. The issue that remains to be resolved in Jamaica is whether that two-thirds vote is to be taken in each house separately, or as is done in Trinidad, with both houses sitting jointly. Secondly, in terms of issues to be resolved, while it has been agreed that the sensitive appointment to be made by the president would be subject, these are the two, sorry, the call of the Chief Justice and so on. While it has been agreed that those appointments would be subject to a two-thirds majority of parliament, there is disagreement as to whether or not it should be by way of affirmative resolution or negative resolution. Then there is disagreement as to whether the two non-party members of the Senate, um, whether they should be chosen by the president on his own discretion, or whether they should be reserved for allocation to any third party that may contest future elections and achieve a minimum threshold, I think 7.5% of the popular vote, failing which if they don't, then those two seats will be shared between the government and opposition. The single greatest issue of disagreement, however, has to do with installing the CCJ as our final appellate court. The government seems unwilling to proceed with any other amendment until this issue is resolved and points to the fact that it can be implemented if the opposition facilitates a two-thirds majority in the Senate. The opposition has maintained its unwillingness to do so, insisting that the matter must be placed before the people in a referendum. It cannot be beyond the government and opposition to resolve these issues. What is disturbing is that they don't seem to be even making an effort to do so. These issues are nowhere on any agenda. There is no giant select committee at work, no bail royal meetings taking place. These are issues that don't stand much of a chance of being resolved when you get, when you are in the run up to an election which is not that far away. I believe too that based on our experiences of the last two decades, since these issues were dealt with, we should do two things. One, we should expand the list of changes already agreed to include other safeguards on which we have subsequently agreed. And B, I think we should consider, but not at the detriment of moving ahead with the package, but I think the opportunity should be taken to look at other constitutional changes that can further enhance the quality of government, governance. I cite in particular the fiscal rules that Peter spoke about yesterday, which were recently enacted in Parliament. These establish specific fiscal wage costs and debt limits and targets that can be suspended only with the prior approval of Parliament and only in the event of constitutionally declared emergencies or severe economic contraction, the fiscal impact of which would have had to have been certified by the Auditor General. Given our long history of fiscal and monetary indiscretion, I believe these provisions are an important restraint on executive excesses. The problem is that as they now exist by simple statute, these rules could be altered or even repealed sooner or later by a simple resolution of Parliament. However much such, a, such an action might affect our relations with the multilateral agencies, I believe it is important for good governance for these to be made constitutional requirements. I believe as well, and I want to run through very quickly all of my recommendations before I close. I believe that the core ministries of government should be specified in the Constitution with some flexibility but with a limit as to the number of additional ministries that any Prime Minister um, would be allowed to establish. I believe that the functions of the Electoral Commission, as it is to be enshrined in the Constitution, should explicitly include the regulation of political financing. I believe that the procedures for the award of government contracts should be settled conclusively and made into law, criminalizing the more flagrant breaches and rendering null and void contracts obtained by corrupt means. It means that if you 
pay money under the table to get a contract and that is established, then you could have built 10 miles of road, not entitled to collect one penny on that. I believe that that would concentrate the minds of contractors wonderfully. I support the proposal for the amalgamation of the Contractor General, the Corruption Prevention Commission, and the Parliamentary Integrity Commission into a single anti-corruption agency that would be enshrined in the Constitution. I have long advocated the establishment within the Constitution of a special prosecutor with special responsibility for pursuing cases involving public corruption. And I'm quite open as to the question as to whether those functions should be incorporated in the single anti-corruption agency or whether it would be a standalone position. Trinidad and Tobago recently made significant amendments to its constitution. I don't think we have had enough discussion about that since yesterday. But they moved to establish term limits for the Prime Minister to provide for the recall of MPs and to require a runoff election if a candidate receives less than 50% plus one in a constituency election. Certainly the first two have long been mooted in Jamaica. It's interesting that in 2011, the United Kingdom established fixed election day. I support term limits, and in fact, I tabled a bill in Parliament for that purpose in 2010. I support fixed election dates. I have reservations about the power to recall because it is too vulnerable to manipulation and corruption. It's one thing when you're having 63 contests going on, when you have only one because that person has been recalled, and it's easy to recall. I mean, you need 20% of the voters, any opposing party with any serious clout would be able to get that, mobilize that. It may take a little time. But if you have a single election, not only is the entire machinery of both parties focused on that one seat interfering with the people's local considerations and determination, but money. And it's something that I am very concerned about. I am concerned about our reservations about runoff election requirements for, the, for similar reasons. Let me make a, just a couple of, 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 of quick points too in terms of new areas that I think we need to look at. The resident magistrate courts constitute by far the largest part of our court system where the vast majority of cases are tried. RMs are technically civil servants. They do not enjoy any security of tenure or protection from interference beyond what applies to ordinary civil servants. They are therefore exposed to the dangers that the constitutional protection provided to judges of the higher court was designed to mitigate. I believe that resident magistrates should be given similar protection. The need for public sector transformation is an issue, the urgency of which is beyond dispute. It is expressed most times in the anguish about excessive bureaucracy, the non-ease of doing business in Jamaica. But it is much more than that. What is required is a strategic realignment within the public sector of responsibility, authority, and accountability. That has constitutional implications, as the Constitution makes specific provisions for the appointment and management of public officers, some of which are entrenched in the Constitution, and therefore serious transformation cannot avoid a re-examination of those provisions. Parliament is not just a face, but a critical part of the machinery of government. It currently functions as the government chamber. Its preoccupation is with government business. Its sittings are viewed by most as boring and uneventful. It can be made to be far more effective as the House of the People's Representatives than in holding the government accountable. I had placed a series of recommendations before Parliament some years ago to amend the standing orders, to strengthen the entitlement and the rights of individual members of Parliament, for example, to address Parliament on matters concerning their constituents. Statements of no more than five minutes and no more than six statements at any one sitting. Um, requirements, for example, for reports of oversight bodies like the contractor general, the auditor general, um, public defender and so on, a requirement that those reports must be debated within 30 days of them being submitted to parliament. Um, parliament regulates its own proceedings through its standing orders and that is where these changes would need to be made. 
But the standing orders can be suspended by a simple resolution. I beg to move that the standing order be suspended and there go all of the provisions. I believe section 48 of the Constitution that deals with the powers and procedure of Parliament should include specific reference to the standing orders and that it should provide further that certain rights of the people's representatives cannot be abrogated by the suspension of the standing orders. My final point. It is said that a country gets the government it deserves. It may also be said that it gets the constitution it deserves, either the one that it demands or the one that it allows its leaders to formulate. It is arguable whether public interest in matters constitutional is any higher today, Trevor, than it was at the time of independence. Yes, there are more civil society groups, and they enjoy exposure to a media that is much larger and penetrative than what existed 52 years ago. But while some of these lobby groups may be reflective of public opinion, they are not representative of the public. Some of them could easily hold their AGMs inside an ATM here. And politicians, I'm speaking as one who spent many years in that endeavor. Politicians tend to view advocacy groups the way Joseph Stalin assessed military might when he asked, how many divisions does the Pope have? Well, Brad told us yesterday about his constituencies and how we can predict within 10, 15 votes what the result is going to be. It is no magic in with the science. And most active serious politicians practice it. What do we do? We do a thing called candor. What is a candor? It's not going door to door and asking people how you plan to vote. It is sitting down with your workers in the community, in a school room under a tree, around somebody's backyard, and you take the voters and say you go through name by name. Ralph Gonzalez, no sign not voting for you. Yeah, and you put an X beside that one. And you go through. Now, in the early days, when I was learning the the craft. You would end up with JLP, PNP, and then a percentage now that you couldn't determine. And your election strategy is to make sure you bring out the JLP, but concentrate your efforts now on those that you can't determine because that's where you can don't waste time with the others because they're not voting for you. Within that group that you couldn't determine were some people who were non voters, but in those days it was primarily Rastafarian and Jehovah Witnesses. What has happened over the years is that that group has swelled to the point where, whereas it used to be 20% of the voters list. As General Secretary, I used to advise my candidates in urban areas, you're going to start off with about 35%. As you work, you will narrow it down to about 20%. You're not going to get it much below that. I would tell the rural candidates, you're going to start off with 20%. As you do your house to house, as you canvass and your campaign, you bring that down to about 10%. And you go into an election knowing that there are still 10% that you don't know, that you have tightened up on the rest. We found that that group of persons had now, were now approaching 50%. And within that 50%, it wasn't that the Rastafarians and Jehovah's Witnesses had done. It was persons who did not vote. Not that you don't know how they're going to vote. They do not vote. And with the aid of computer technology, candidates are now able to Score information so they are able to look at the last four elections. And this one has not voted in any of the last four elections. So you just put a wide circle around those. Don't worry about those. Those can neither help you nor hurt you because they're not voting. And uh, the response the dissat that the dissatisfaction that I spoke about yesterday, a person, is normally translated into a disengagement from the process which means that the process is now left to those who may be dissatisfied, but not so much dissatisfied because they want any fundamental change, but dissatisfied simply because the system is not working in their favor. Dissatisfaction with the lack of progress. What is seen by so many as the broken promise of independence has led them to disengage. There are even persons among the leadership of civil society groups who will say with pride, I did not vote, almost as if this is a validation of their 
non-alignment of their untaintedness. The media plays a critical role in shaping public opinion. Yep. But the media can only give expression to public opinion if that public opinion is alert, aroused, if it is informing itself on the issues, if it is advancing enlightened positions. If it doesn't do that, then the media has nothing to work with. And then we run into another danger of the media becoming the mouthpiece for those who either own it or those who have access to it, rather than reflecting the views of the public. The point I'm making is, it's not just the constitutional framers who need to be held to account. And it is not just those who are now in a position to make a, a difference, to make a change, who need to be held account. The people need to hold themselves account to account as well. Because in this atmosphere of ambivalence, of disengagement, of alienation, it is in that atmosphere that bad government governance thrives best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Gordon. When our seasoned politician, our uh, prime minister, someone who used to be a prime minister, says the final point, let's take 24, 25 minutes more. Um, and I was a bit concerned that thanks for keeping us at 10 minutes rather than five. Um, and, I'll invite, <laughs> and I'll invite a few questions. <laughs> Horace Matthews from the Marcus Garvey People's Political Party. I must give thanks for your wonderful presentation, Mr. Bowley. And with your wealth of knowledge and all your colleagues, there was a Jamaican that we gave the status of first national hero who 50 years before independence wrote an essay, The Ideal State, which he put together the system of governance that he thought would have taken the people to that um, utopic state that we all dream about. Mm -hmm. Now I notice we have never tried the philosophy of Marcus Garvey in our governance. Why, Mr. Golden? I don't think it would be fair, Harris, to say that we haven't tried it. There are elements of, of Garvey's philosophy that inform it. Uh, some of the decisions that were made in the framing of the Constitution. I think what is <coughs> undeniable is that more of that philosophy needs to inform both the review that we are now, the halted review or the stalled review that is now taking place, as well as some of the new directions in which we need to move. Um, I do feel, quite frankly, you know, I have a family member who is deeply involved in that process, that there's much that could guide us. Uh, mind you, Garvey was 50 years ago, no? And a great deal has, has changed since then, and a lot of new experiences would have to be factored in as well, but I believe it is still relevant. Good morning. My name is Paulette Smith. I'm a PhD candidate of the University of the West Indies. My question to you, Mr. Golding, is to what extent has Westminster, Whitehall, influenced public policy in Jamaica, and in particular, how has it contributed to Jamaica's indebtedness, if it has? I, I don't think that we can blame the constitutional framework um, to a great extent for, for indebtedness. We have to accept responsibility for that. Um, I, I would be prepared to argue that if we had a presidential arrangement that involved, in our situation, greater concentration of power because there was, it would not, it would be unlikely for there to be any real separation between the executive and the legislature, given the way we vote, that our indebtedness could probably, would probably be even greater. So, I, what I try to say in the presentation, you know, is that we can find as many countries with Westminster-type systems 
as we can find with non-Westminster type systems, including the presidential system and any variation of that, that are in the same predicament that they are in. I don't believe that it is a constitutional system that determines this. It is the way in which, as I said, the way in which the functionaries within that constitutional framework, the way in which they exercise their function. Pardon me? No. I'm, I'm sorry, in the interest of time, I'm going to now take your two questions. Now, Mr. Bruno will respond. We'll take two more. And similarly to the policy of MCD and so forth, in the interest of time, we're focusing on the person who are under. Uh, so after what was over, now Mr. Bruno will keep questions uh, during the day. Good morning. My name is Gerald Williams. Some years ago, I listened to an excellent speech. It goes something like this. Let the rich to the poor. Let the work to be blessed to be stressed. This was a made with Americans. I believe that enough of the talking. I am one plain, practical Jamaica. There are some unbiblical cards that need to be cut, severed, and forgotten. One of them, we call it cronyism. This must go. I am saying that, or I'm suggesting here that for example, when there's a contract, a uh, construction contract, for example, it should be shared. We are blessed in that there's a army here, the Jamaica Defense Force. There's a unit that is skilled, highly skilled. And I believe that if there's a construction to be undertaken, it should be shared. Part of it, however it is shared, should be given to the army to do. That would be a, a, a cost cutting endeavor. The other, whoever, think on it. Sorry, before I answer Mr. Bowling, before he did that, Jordan, before, um, I was just informed that we're way behind. I'm going to turn to um, Dr. Maloney, Dr. Kinsley, Dr. Davis, and Dr. Silver, if they can give the question to you today. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. My name is Peter John Gordon from the Department of Economics. Uh, Mr. Golding, you um, proposed a, a presidency that would take on um, some, some tasks which are independent of, of the political directorate. Uh, in your thinking, do you perceive of strengthening a office of the presidency which would go beyond uh, what exists currently at King's House? Since uh, this president would be required to deal with a whole month multiplicity of issues over which she or she cannot have any personal competence. <laughs> well, in, in quick answer to the previous one, the JDF Eng Engineering Corps is utilized on a number of public projects um, from time to time. But bear in mind, from my recollection, the complement of the Engineering Corps is about 35. Um, and there's a limit to what 35 people can do. We, we have to find a way to to deal with the question of the award of contract. Right now, I think that perhaps in trying to tighten it up, we have, we have made it too cumbersome. Um, I think we need to look at, at how we can do it in a way that allows for it to operate um, smoothly and quickly, uh, but at the same time, allows for it to operate in a transparent way. And um, I suggested that we need to firm that up and we also need to, to bring that into law, because right now it is not a matter of law. On the question of the presidency, um, what 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 we are going to have if the agreements that we have arrived at so far are implemented is really a hybrid. I don't think that anywhere else in the world expects it. It is not going to require a large establishment in the president's office because the president is not going to have daily function. But the past would need some amount of expansion since he's going to have to be consulting 
um, on so many appointments that have to be made. It wouldn't be significant. Um, but, it, but in fact, he's going to be a quasi-executive president. There's no question at all about that. And in that president is, 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 is the person, the hands in which the real balance in the constituency is going, in the constitution is going to be placed. Which, which makes the process of selection of that person to uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Gordon, for your usual innovative presentation. I thank everyone who has attended the presentation. As I said before, we didn't have the time to see all the questions that Mr. Gordon is available to respond to our speakers in the debate that we we'll have. Thanks again, and we will reconvene in the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes for the next segment of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.